it's Friday, 5.30 in the p.m. And this is your host, U.S. Representative Danny Davis. Oh, let me tell you, there's so much going on in Chicago and in the United States of America until it is unbelievable. Of course, in Chicago, we've had the Jason Van Dyke trial and uh, the jury has issued a verdict. People are reacting to that verdict all over town. The West Side black elected officials reacted and I want to read you what Alderman Emma Mitt said on behalf of the West Side black elected officials. Alderman Mitt said, now that the verdict is in from the Jason Van Dyke trial, we commend the city of Chicago for its planning and community engagement efforts to maintain peace in an uncertain moment. We understand those who are not satisfied with the verdict and join with them in peaceful protest and demonstrations. We thank, we commend them for their continuous fight for justice. We thank the jurors for their thoughtful deliberations in a tough trial, and we commend the judge for the manner in which he handled the trial. We thank our activist community for their thoughtful engagement and peaceful protests. We know that there are still serious flaws in our justice system, and we pledge to fight on until we feel that justice is fair and equal, and righteousness runs down like a powerful stream. We ask all of our citizens to be peaceful, to remain vigilant, and to make sure that we vote in all elections, especially in November and the mayoral election in February and in April. That's from Alderman Emma Mitz, chairman of the West Side Black elected officials. And then from the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus, where State Senator Kimberly Lightfoot is the chairman. And she's also from the west side of Chicago because she's from Maywood, Illinois. And she says that the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus Chair Kimberly A. Lightfoot Maywood released the following statement as the jury in the Chicago police officer Jason Van Dyke trial deliberated their decision in the trial of the 2014 shooting of Laquan McDonald. Well, I know members of Laquan McDonald's family, especially the person who has been the chief spokesperson for the family, Reverend M. H. Hunter, and I commend the family for sticking together through this process. But here's what Kimberly Lightfoot said. As we await a decision from the jury, I would like to make it clear how important this trial is to our communities throughout the state of Illinois. The last time a Chicago police officer was convicted of murder, was nearly 50 years ago. And there are many who feel justice has not been served time and time again in Chicago and across the country. I urge the public to react with solidarity regardless of the verdict. We need to come together and let our voices be heard for all of the times black people missed out on their due justice. If you want to yell, yell. 
If you want to gather, gather. Let's show how we feel in a peaceful and impactful manner. My hope is that we can take this moment to come together to heal Chicago and communities throughout Illinois that are longing for police officers that work for them and a criminal justice system that treats them fairly. Our work does not start or end here. We should not be deterred should this trial's outcome not be in our favor. And of course, uh, State Representative Camille Lilly, who is also from the West Side, is the chairman of the state legislators in the House. And um, I am glad that they both represent me in terms of where I live. Camille Lilly is the state representative for the state district that I live in. And uh, Kimberly, her district does not quite include where I live. Her district is a little bit west of where I live. I'm going to get to the callers in just a second, but I do want to mention that it looks as though that Brett Kavanaugh is going to become a member of the Supreme Court of the United States of America. From all indications, it looks as though the Republicans are going to have the votes for at the very least a tie vote and of course you know if there's a tie vote then the vice president gets a chance to break the tie and we don't have any doubt about what will happen if the vice president gets an opportunity to break the tie so we're going to be talking about all of those things and anything else that you want to talk about. And you know that you can give us a call at any time, and we eagerly await your call. There's a caller, I believe, on the line, and we'll go right to that caller. Caller, are you there? Hi, Dr. David. James, I am wonderful. How are you? Okay, when you go out to uh, Malcolm X College or in your uh, neighborhood, like uh, an event, uh, or Malcolm X College or, or in your uh, area, like a, like an event, like a Halloween or something else. Yeah, all of those. We'll have something coming up. Um, call me, I can't remember right this second, but call me at 773. Uh-huh. Five three three at the office, right? Seven five two zero. Yep. Okay, I called you on uh, Monday. All right. Okay. okay. I'll have a good weekend, Connor Davis. You too, and we will definitely have some things coming up. Okay. Bye. All right. Thank you. Of course, caller, you can give us a call. Our number is three one two seven three eight one zero six zero. We eagerly await your call. Well, this is also the political season. It's my position that anytime two people interact, there's some political action taking place. Unless those two people always agree, and if two people agree all the time, it's also my position that one of them is unnecessary. <laughs> and so it's nothing wrong with expressing your position, your point of view, and you don't have to be divided. Every time somebody disagrees with me, it does not mean they are right and I am wrong. 
It means that they have their position and I have my position. And the positions change if one person is able to convince the other one that they've got the right position. I never worry about people disagreeing. I used to disagree with my mother, but she was always right. <laughs> or at least if she was not, I always said she was right. And I always said, yes, ma'am, you are right. R-I-G-H-T, right. Well, let me tell you, if you don't have that kind of relationship with your mother, then I kind of feel sorry for you. I am so fortunate. Honest to goodness. My family, my mom and daddy, my aunts and uncles, my cousins and all those folks, they, we had one uncle that used to make moonshine. And as tight as our cousins were with us, they never showed us where that steel was. We'd go over to their house. They lived out in the woods, kind of. Uncle John Adams, that was his name. He was Aunt Daisy's husband. And we'd play with their kids and all that, and we'd be playing out there in the woods and back in the but they ain't never yet showed us where that whiskey steel was. And everybody knew that Uncle John made moonshine. Well, let's go to the phone and see who we got. Caller, are you there? Uh, yes, Congressman. And first, uh, it's a great day to be on God's green earth. And the uh, last comment, like you said, if a person don't agree not agree. Let me, let me, if you don't have no belief in what your mother say to you, I feel so sorry for you. Uh, you know, I used to always say, well, she told me there was a Santa Claus. <laughs> Up until right this moment, I believe there's a Santa Claus. I teach my family there is a Santa Claus. Now, she didn't never tell me about no Peter Cottontail come bouncing down the street. <laughs> so I don't even want to hear no mess like that. You know, but again, my, my daddy was sometimes funny, but he he knew he'd be joking. He said, look, well, if my there ain't no Santa that... and it ain't no claw. Ain't nothing but your mowing paw. <laughs> <laughs> so... Well, if, if whatever my mother would have told me, I would have believed it, you know? And that's number one. Now, number two, what I really want to say is this. I'm not a man that likes to, uh, I, everyone has a belief. I like to keep my train moving. I don't want to stay all day, all night, every day, all over, every month, every week, every year talking about the same stuff because it's not going to do any good. You're just running your mouth. Keep your mouth closed and move on to something else. Now, I heard about... Now they they saying there's a great possibility he might be our next Supreme Court judge. Now they said that the Democrats are now working on a way to maybe have him even impeach. I have never heard of a Supreme Court judge being impeached. I didn't know that you could do anything. So, again, you know what we do. We wait for every Friday till you get there. If we need to know anything about the politics, we know we got our fighter right there with you, our pit bull. So, please, I'm going to get out there. Can you kind of explain that? Can it be done? Possibility, or well, has it ever? I think so there's been one Supreme Court justice who was impeached. Now, there have been federal judges impeached. As a matter of fact, uh, our good friend, Alcee Hastings, was a federal judge. He was impeached. Then he came back and ran for Congress. And he's been in Congress 20-some years. Well, we know you can almost go to jail and then come back out and be almost president. But again, <laughs> I, I, I did not know exactly what is the process of impeaching a Supreme 
court judge. You know what I did? I heard that last week who this one person was, and they talked about a guy named Abe Fortis, who was uh, Lyndon Johnson's good buddy and all that. I believe Lyndon Johnson, either Franklin Delano Roosevelt. But I will check that this week, and I'll tell you next week. Well, but you the know, actual I, I, process is that you'd have to go through in order to impeach. And the people who were discussing it, they were saying that it was possible, but highly unlikely. Yeah, um, well, um, listen, I, I'll be here next Friday unless God decide to take me up there. Just make sure when you see me, tell me what there, and thanks for taking the call. All right, thank you very much. Thank you indeed. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll check that out and make sure that we have an accurate answer for the process and when it happened and all of that. I am not an individual who believes in pretending that I know something that I don't know. And I want to make sure that whatever I give out or whatever I say is accurate. So we'll look that up and we'll have a good answer next week. Country is very split on a lot of things. And we all hope and pray that our country gets closer together. There are people who predicted that our last vote for election was going to split the country more. And I do believe that it did. And we'll have to wait and see what happens a couple years from now when we get ready to either elect or re-elect a president. But in the meantime, if somebody can answer the question for me, I keep hearing how great unemployment is in our country that unemployment is under 4%. And in many communities throughout America, there are help wanted signs. But in much of the community where we live, in Chicago, and I can mention other places as well, in Illinois, in Chicago, we have the highest black unemployment in the nation. Can anybody call and tell us why? Why do you think black unemployment is so high in Chicago or in the black, predominantly black areas of Cook County? And so anybody that think they've got a good explanation for that or some opinion about it, everybody have a right to their opinion. Everybody also can have a right to be wrong. I mean, you don't have to be right because you have an opinion. And the opinion that you have does not have to be accurate but you still have the right to have it. I think part of it has to do with the Rust Belt being an area in our country where so much machinery and equipment and things were manufactured and, and developed and some of that has gone away. Make sure we get the good answer. Let me go right to the phone and get your explanation. Go right ahead. Davis. Yes. Okay, so I think you were kind of alluding to the, to the, to the answer to your question. And I guess a lot of it is uh, 
that there's not much participation amongst the African, I want to say African Americans because there's so many other minorities, uh, you know, um, in the in the country these days, and and, and there's not a lot of uh, how you want to say it, black self-employment, uh, black uh, businesses, and uh, black people uh, to just start that whole process that we had where the black monopolies, what they call them, black metropolises, you know, uh, so maybe we feel, you know, like in the black community, there's so many different ethnic groups that have businesses, but there's so few African American companies, I mean, uh, uh, participating in the, in the marketplaces out there, so we need to do more. I, I would think they, it's this early in the season and we can start looking at snow removal businesses, you know. I had a lot of black folks to do that. Even train some youngsters in uh, high school, the, the Chicago tra work, work training programs to do some of that stuff and switch it over to right the passage and uh, safe passage and all those other kinds of things. Anyway, I think I'll uh, take my hat off uh, uh, what you think uh, about my career. Well, uh, uh, I, I think all of that is true. But, you know, I've seen black soul food restaurants go out of business. I don't know much of anything I'd rather have to eat than some good turnip greens with some hot water cornbread and maybe a little okra and you know whatever you want on the side you know cucumbers or whatever beets I I relish that stuff uh, where can I find it where can I go to get it I mean where can I have it I think a lot of other folks' taste buds about the same as mine. I'm saying they grew up eating the same stuff that I grew up eating. I still like it. My taste buds have not changed, and but I can't find it. I'm, I'm saying trying to find it is not easy. Or oh, a good bowl of black-eyed peas with some okra and I know the ham hock thing ain't too cool but you know a little turkey butt or something like that to kind of add to it I really like that stuff I'm, I'm, I mean I'd rather eat that than to eat a steak down on the seventh floor of a good restaurant in the loop but I can't find it and please don't make any succotash you know you take some okra and some corn and cut it up and put it in the same container and cook it and you know I could be eating that until the cows come home now I admit that I'm up in age, and there are some people who've never had that, but I've had it, and I just loved it. As a matter of fact, my mother used to even make something, she'd actually make a big pot of liquor on greens, and then she'd take some cornbread and crumble the cornbread up in it. And that became a side dish of its own. Uh, I forgot what they called it. I think my father used to call it mush or something, but that's not really what it was. But that stuff would be good too. I mean, we'd eat it till you couldn't see. Um, we used to take buttermilk and cornbread and crumble it up and have what we call milk and bread. I mean, I still like it. I just can't find it and can't get it. So, hey, 
Maybe next week we'll talk about how you reestablish some of these things. Or how we just get what we like. But I'm glad to know that things are still going peaceful. Protesters are still protesting. And it's their right to do so. But you can protest and not tear up the town. Just understand that and you have a right to every expectation of fair treatment that this country promised when they said we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness We'll see you next week.